Wondery Plus subscribers can binge all episodes of Ghost Story ad-free. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. I want to tell you a story. Well, it's really three stories all wrapped around each other. It's a ghost story. It's a murder mystery. And it's a family drama. By which I mean it's about my wife's family, her family's history. And there's a chance they'll disown me for doing this. If you come out with a piece that says he was a murderer, then I will be sorry that we ever said we would contribute to it. But before we get into any of that, let's start at the beginning with the thing that set all of this in motion. When I was 16 back in the 90s, my family moved to an old Victorian house in London on a street called Queen's Road. I slept in a bedroom tucked into the creaky top floor and weird things would happen up there. I'd wake up and objects would have moved across the room, specifically this one vase. When I go to bed, it'd be on the mantelpiece. And then in the morning, I'd find it on the desk. I'd put it back, and the next morning I'd find it somewhere else. Lights would flash on and off on their own. And I'd get this uncomfortable cold feeling whenever I was alone in the house. It freaked me out at the time, but the truth is, I didn't really think much of it. I was a teenager. I had other things on my mind. Every now and then, I'd ask my sister if she was messing with me but she always swore she wasn't. I grew up, left home, and became a journalist for Al Jazeera. I cover things like French labour strikes and the war in Ukraine. I don't believe in ghosts. So when my family moved out of the house on Queen's Road, I completely forgot about the weird stuff that happened in there. Until that is, a few years ago, a man reached out, an old neighbour of ours, with a story about that very room. I mean, it's quite a story. His name is Charles Pennellis, and he knows everything about this neighbourhood. You could say he's a bit of a gossip, but you probably shouldn't. Slanderous. Gives completely the wrong impression. Anyway, this is what he told me. Charles was walking around my old neighbourhood one day, going door to door, collecting donations for the local museum. I was there rattling a tin. And definitely not gossiping. Well, I mean, it was just Sensei's still there and Sensei's moved out and they've had a divorce and all that sort of business. Eventually, he gets to my old house and knocks on the door. A woman answers. She's the mother of the house. After chatting for a bit, she invites him inside and she tells him a story unlike anything he's ever heard before. The story goes, the American swans up with a hello. And- Here's what she tells him. One day, the woman is at home at my old house. She looks out of the window and she sees a man standing on the driveway. So the mother of the house opens the door. It's someone who used to live in the house, an American man who'd lived there with his wife and two children. The American says to her, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I just have to know. Do you still have that ghost in the top bedroom? Straight, like that. What the American man proceeds to tell her, the things his family experienced on the top floor, it makes her go completely white. Because this isn't the first time she's heard of something going on up there. She just never believed it before. This struck a chord since the daughter had always insisted that there was a ghost in her bedroom, which would manifest itself on occasions and sit on her bed. The woman's daughter, starting when she was around 10, began complaining about a ghost visiting her room at night, specifically the ghost of a faceless woman. She said to me, oh yes, my daughter told me about some goings on, some sort of faceless woman who comes and sits on my bed. And she said, I always batted them away on the basis that we don't believe in that sort of thing. So I rang your father, and he said, that was Tristram's room. 
So I imagine he phoned you and the cat was out of the bag. (laughs) I promise you, and I hope you believe me, that I don't normally find myself having conversations like this or even entertaining these sorts of ideas. But it's kind of weird, right? You now have three completely unconnected families who have had some sort of strange, inexplicable experience in the top floor of that house. I think it's wonderful. It was definitely intriguing, but it probably wouldn't have been anything more than a story I'd tell my friends in the pub. Except I couldn't stop thinking about this faceless woman. And that's because there's another coincidence, something I hadn't thought about in years. So I guess Tristan and I had just started going out and um, they invited my parents around to his house um, to come and say hi. I first learned about it when my wife Kate and I had just started dating about 20 years ago. My family still lived in the house on Queen's Road, the one with the supposed ghost. And Kate was staying with us. And my granddad was in London, so they invited him over too. She was very close to her grandfather, so my folks asked if he'd join us. So granddad arrived. Um, He's got nice rosy cheeks, granddad, like all the men in my family. He wore a beret every day to keep his bald head warm. And then my granddad walked into the house, and before he said anything else, he said... My mother was murdered in the house next door. And I don't think we had ever put two and two together between where Tris lived and this big murder that happened in the family. To be clear, I'd never heard about this murder before. In fact, Kate didn't know a lot about it either just that her great-grandmother had been killed decades before. She had no idea that it happened here. Neither of us had any clue at the time that my new girlfriend's family had any connection to this neighbourhood, let alone the house next door. But the details of the murder make the coincidence even stranger. Because just next door to my house, the house supposedly haunted by a faceless woman, Kate's great-grandmother was killed by two gunshots to the face. From Wondery and Pineapple Street Studios, this is Ghost Story. I'm Tristan Redman. Episode 1, The House Next Door. We've now come to the murder story, but before I tell it, I want to tell you a bit about my wife's family, the Dancys, because the murder didn't happen in my family. It happened in theirs. And the Dancys are a pretty impressive bunch. I'm going to take you through a tiny family tree. I'll start with the bald guy in the beret, or a beret to you Americans. He's my wife's grandfather. He was the one who announced that his mother had been murdered in the house next door. He was a well-known headmaster of elite private schools in England, including the one Kate Middleton went to. Then there's his son, my father-in-law, Jonathan Dancy, who's also bald and wears a beret. He's a pretty famous philosopher. What if lying is ethical in this situation? What if a certain actions aren't universally good or bad, like Jonathan Dancy says? So much so that he's name-dropped in an episode of The Good Place. Jonathan Dancy, are you talking about moral particularism? We never even covered that. And then there's his son, Hugh Dancy, my brother-in-law. First positions, please. Roll the camera. That's him in the latest Downton Abbey movie. And action! (gasps) Coming down the stairs, not expecting to find him there, waiting for you. Hugh is Hollywood famous. He's not bald, and frankly, he doesn't look great in a beret. He's been in a bunch of movies and TV shows, Black Hawk Down, Hannibal, and my personal favorite, obviously, Ella Enchanted. You're the first maiden I've met who hasn't swooned at the sight of me. Then maybe I've done you some good. And then there's my wife, Kate. We met at university. 
These days, she works for the United Nations. Before that, she was a diplomat. And as if she couldn't be more impressive, she literally used to save children for Save the Children. Let's go straight to the expert on the UN, Kate Redman. Kate, what can you tell us about the decision? So I work at UNESCO, which is one of the UN agencies. It works on education. I'm not a dancy, but I'm also pretty bald these days. And when I married Kate, the dancies gave me a beret of my own so I could fit in. When you first meet the dancies, they can be a bit intimidating, but they're also warm and funny. And after 20 years of hanging around them, they've become my family too. But in all that time, I hardly ever heard anyone talk about the murder. It wasn't a secret, but aside from that lunch with Kate's grandfather, it just never really came up in conversation. Until I started asking questions about it. What story did your dad tell you when you were 18? That his mother had been murdered. Not until you were 18? Mm. This is my father-in-law. I call him Johnny. He's the good place philosopher. He seems to be the only family member who was told about the murder on purpose. So he has the closest to the official version of it. He was driving me back from Oxford. I must have been an undergraduate there. And we were just going over the Ridgeway. And he just started telling me this story. Perhaps he started off by saying something like, I was younger than you when my mother died. And your grandmother didn't die a natural death. But I should tell you how it happened. The woman who was killed was Johnny's grandmother and my wife's great-grandmother, named Naomi Dancy. The year was 1937, and Naomi was a pioneering doctor in London. She and her husband lived in the house on Queen's Road, just next door to where I grew up. So my grandmother's brother was living in the house, Morris. He was sort of disturbed because uh, he was being damaged in the war. Naomi's brother, Morris, was struggling with shell shock after World War I. He'd come home with a piece of shrapnel in his brain, having lost an eye. I don't know where this detail originated from, but it would later be reported that Naomi had particularly beautiful eyes. And as Morris lost sight in his own, he developed a deep jealousy of them. Anyhow, one night, Naomi was in bed, she'd gone to bed early. And Morris came into the room and and shot her in both eyes. And then he went into the upstairs loo and cut his throat. Um, That's the story, really. Uh, Yeah, that's the story. This is why, when I learned about the faceless woman in my childhood bedroom, I thought about Naomi. I wanted to know more about her and what happened that night. Who was Naomi? Uh, Well, that is a very good question. I know nothing. I didn't even know her name until you started working on this. Did you know anything else about her? Nope. Except no one seems to know much about her. I mean, as far as the family goes, there is nothing. Is it, is it Naomi? Am I saying the name right? And in fact, as the story has been passed down through the generations, it's become less about Naomi and more about the man who survived to tell the tale. The critical narrative part was Vader jumped off the stairs, like to dodge a bullet or something like this. Because there was someone else in the house that night. Naomi's husband, John Dancy, my wife's great-grandfather, known in the family as Fader. The way I've always told it was that Fader not only switched off the lights, but also flung himself backwards down the stairs. The name Fader is a sort of play on the word father. Father, Fader. Anyway, the story goes that the brother Morris tried to kill Fader that night too, but Fader dodged the bullet and narrowly escaped. It was, it was an action story great-granddad had done like a really cool James Bond, jumping over the banisters, shooting out the light, do a, like one of those roles that commandos do, and then, and then shot the guy. I'm doing the guns, like. More like a gunslinger. <laughs> All details of Naomi have fallen away. 
And what remains is admiration for Feather and his daring escape. Is that like, does that make him a hero? Yes. And this makes some sense. Feather has sort of an outsized influence on the family. They say it was Feather who established an obsession with education that the Dancys retain to this day. Even outside of the family, his presence is larger than life. There's a BBC documentary about the guy, his portrait once hung in the Royal Academy of Arts. He's the family patriarch, and one of the reasons we're calling him Feather here is that there are so many John Dancys in this family. There's one with his name in every generation. Which brings us to the third story, the family drama. Because just two days after I heard from my old neighbour about the ghost in my teenage bedroom, my wife discovered something. Something that totally called into question this heroic image of Feather and the family story of the murder. Can you remember the story of how you ended up finding that article? Was it like a sort of Google wormhole you were basically in? I go down so many Google wormholes, yeah. Kate's helping her dad with an obituary for her grandfather, the one that was headmaster at Kate Middleton School. She's poking around online to see what's out there, and she remembers him telling us about his mother's murder in the house next door. And I looked up something like Dancy, murder, Richmond, not expecting really to find anything, and I did. I came across this crazy article on the National Archives website, and I, I had no idea why it was there. It was written by an archivist who happened to stumble upon the file from Naomi's murder. Apparently, most murder files are kept in one building in London in the National Archives. And out of thousands of cases, this murder stood out to her. She found the police files so strange that she decided to write about it. She gives the broad strokes of the murder story, but then she raises some serious questions about what happened that night. So, I think it says... Murder-suicide or double murder, question mark. It was mind-blowing for me because the article questioned who was the guilty party and suggested that potentially it was my great-granddad and not the brother. And that was the first I'd considered the idea or even read any suggestion that the case was not sort of closed and clean and and that the right guilty party had been found. Kate forwards the article to her family to see if this could be true, and none of them had heard anything like it before. It was hard to tell how seriously to take the article, but at the very least we now realise that there was a different version of the story floating around and it was totally unlike the official Dancy family story. I mean, obviously the question was, did Feather do it? Kill them both. Kate's family decides this blog post is no big deal, nothing to take seriously, better to just keep moving and let it be. But I couldn't stop thinking about it, So I did some reporting, went back to the source, and got my hands on the original police file. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go, let's Let's go. Let's do it. And because I'm no murder detective, I called one up to help me understand it. Really anxious to hear what you make of all this, Jackie. Oh, I find the story fascinating. The hair stood on the back of my neck when I read it. And once I started reading it, my little curiosity project took on much bigger proportions. On an autumn day in 2022, my producer colleague Annie Brown and I are standing outside a little cottage in a quaint village in Surrey, waiting to meet a retired senior police officer from Scotland Yard. Have you, we've got the police file in your back. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, 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 Jackie. Jackie Moulton spent nearly 30 years in the job and became one of the only female detective chief inspectors at a time when men dominated these jobs. There's a hit TV show in the UK that's based on her called Prime Suspect. Helen Mirren plays Jackie. 
I was a career detective, that's all I ever wanted to be was a detective. We dealt with murders, rapes, domestic violence, I was a hostage negotiator, fraud cases, the whole gambit of crime. After my wife Kate found that article raising questions about who might have actually killed Naomi, I wanted to have an expert walk us through the original police file to help us understand it. Okay, can you explain to me what you're looking at? So in front of me, I have the file relating to the murder that was in the National Archives. Well, it's the record of the crime and what happened. It's a storybook, really. The narrative of the criminal incident witnessed from different points of view. In this case, we have the most important statement from John Dancy. Um, by the way, I, I should say that... In my wife's family, there are a lot of people called John Dancy. Um, so what do we call him, Dr. Dancy? We call him, we call him in what he's called in the family, which is favour. Oh, I can't say that. I can't say that because there's no evidence. Sure. Um, but I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll call him favour just because it's so confusing for people listening to the story. But if I don't, if I'm not consistent, but for, from you, it's totally fine. We're going to spend much more time with Jackie and Faith's statement later. But for now, I want to walk through the night of the murder from Fayther's point of view. His account is the most detailed version of what happened that night, as told to the cops directly after the murder. So this is a statement of John Horace Dancy, aged 46, a medical practitioner, who says, I am a medical practitioner and at the moment semi-retired. My wife, Naomi Dancy, was assistant medical officer of health at Hammersmith, where she has worked for 16 years. We had three children. The statement's rather long, so we'll just be reading parts of it right now. In these first opening sentences, Fader is outlining the main characters in the story. We've got Fader himself, his wife, Naomi Dancy, and her brother, Morris Tribe. Morris Tribe, aged 44, an army officer pensioned with severe head wounds and with loss of an eye was my brother-in-law. Remember, Morris Tribe came back from World War I with a piece of shrapnel lodged in his brain, having lost an eye. Fader tells us that Morris's mental health has been deteriorating, he's been drinking more and more, and he's staying with the Dancies on Queen's Road so they can look after him. And now, let's pick up with the night of the murder. Faith's statement starts the clock at around midnight. Naomi Dancy had arrived home late from a lecture she was giving across town. Faith tells us what happens next. I sent my wife to bed and went and peeled an orange for her and told her to go to sleep as she was tired and I would write to the children and get it off tonight. Then I went to my study on the first floor and started to type letters to the children. Just after midnight, with Naomi in bed, Fader settles into write to his three kids at boarding school, sending them updates from home. Morris is also still awake. I could hear Morris, who was in the next room, moving about. I left my door a little ajar so that I could hear what he was doing. Fader is listening for Morris's movements because he says he's already nervous about what Morris is capable of. He explained earlier in the statement that Morris has recently been threatening Naomi, even specifically threatening to shoot her eyes out. About 1.10 a.m., I gauged the time because I rang the ambulance up 20 minutes afterwards. I heard him go to the lavatory and lock the door. And shortly afterwards, I heard shots. I thought it was three. I went to the door and saw Morris advancing towards me. I said, Morris, what have you done? He was advancing towards me with the revolver in his hand pointed at my head. I tried to reason with him, but he kept coming towards me saying nothing. I pretended to lean against the door and I realised he meant to shoot me. I switched the light out and dropped flat to the floor. He shot as I fell, and the bullet whizzed by my ear and went through the back window. I laid quite still and pretended that I was hit. He then went into the lavatory and closed the door behind him. 
So, Feather is lying on the floor of the landing, pretending to be injured. His wife, Naomi, is in their bedroom to his right. And his brother-in-law, Morris, has just disappeared into the lavatory off the landing. I went to the lavatory door and tried to force it. I found it was locked from inside, and I called on him to come out and give me the gun. He said, stand away from those panels, or I'll shoot you like a dog. I should warn you, the last section of his statement gets pretty graphic. I then went into the bedroom. I saw my wife in bed. She had been shot through both eyes and blood was spursing from one of her eyes. Eventually, after a struggle, I forced the door of the lavatory with my shoulder. I found Morris in a somewhat sitting position with his head bent forward. A razor fell from his hand as I pushed the door open. I felt for his pulse and found him pulseless. I left him and went into the bedroom to look at my wife. After a lapse of a few minutes, I telephoned the ambulance and later the police. Signed, John Dancy. At 9.30am on the 23rd of November, 1937. The story of the murder was picked up by newspapers all over the world, from Tennessee to Dublin, Wisconsin to Liverpool. There was something about it that seemed to grip people. Maybe because women doctors were so rare in the first place, or the gruesome specifics of the crime. The headlines read, Envied his sister's eyes, so killed her, or Brilliant woman doctor shot dead. But it was also Fayther's escape that fascinated readers. Nearly every article included a dramatic first-hand account of his standoff with Morris and the gory cinematic details that Fayther shared with the press. But this statement is just the first document in the police report. And the more that you read, the more questions that you have to ask yourself. And I would have done this investigation a lot differently. As Jackie, Annie and I make our way through the file, we get to a point in the story that the archivist noted in her blog post. At this point, some anonymous letters had started to come in. The final documents in the file are two anonymous letters sent to the police by members of the public in the aftermath of the murder. They're barely legible, but both letters urge the cops to look into the husband. One says, quote, Believe me, I am not the only person over here who thinks he murdered his wife and brother-in-law himself. So if you get one of these letters, what are you thinking? Well, I wouldn't have investigated it like it's been investigated in the first place, but if I received anonymous letters, that would give me a nagging doubt that I had missed something. And... What the police do in this is just minimise it and ignore it. I mean, it can all be true. Let's face it, it can all be true. But these are the unanswered questions. OK, at this point, here's where I am. There's a ghost in my teenage bedroom, a faceless woman. Somehow... I've married a woman whose ancestors just happened to live in the house next door. And one of them had her eyes shot out. And now it seems like there's a suspect in her family that no one has ever looked into. And let me throw in one more wrench. That bedroom, the one with the faceless woman in the moving vase, it's where my wife and I first got together. It was actually in this house in Richmond. That was when we sort of might have realised that there was something maybe more than just being flatmates. Remember, Kate and I met at university, and the first few years we were really just friends. Even though we shared an apartment, nothing ever happened between us. But then the summer before our final year, Kate came to visit me at my parents' house on Queen's Road. Um, the in Tristan's bedroom. <laughs> I'm sure his parents will be delighted to hear that that's where we actually got together concretely. I'm too British to say it any other way. (laughs) (laughs) The night that we got together concretely 
was a big turning point for us. We went from being friends to dating to married five years later. Maybe it was random. Maybe it was fate. But could it have been some sort of paranormal intervention? Listen, I don't actually believe Kate's great-grandmother was there in the room with us that night, manipulating us for her own purposes. I'm not totally nuts. But has the thought crossed my mind since I started this project? Yes. Yes, it has. Do you think you're going to come across as like the wacko ghost believer? In the family? Yeah. I, I hope not. I realise that at best, at best, opening up a 90-year-old murder case involving your family, Katie, and wondering if there's any link between the murder and a ghost in my teenage bedroom <laughs> is totally ridiculous. <laughs> and at worst, it's a very bad idea as a son-in-law to be doing this. I mean, I, it, is, it is totally wacko. <laughs> but is it a terrible idea? In many ways, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but here are the questions I need to answer, right? Did your great-grandfather get away with murder? Is your great-grandmother the faceless woman haunting my teenage bedroom? And while we're at it, did we end up married because this ghost wants me to solve a murder that everyone's been getting wrong for a century? I mean, it sounds like so far-fetched, but um, it's like you, you've kind of opened many doors and you've kind of got to work out where they're going to go. So you don't have to be diplomatic. Do I have your blessing to pursue this story? Oh, yeah, you do. You do. You do have my blessing. And then at the same time, I sort of have this sort of strange gut reaction that's like, God, I hope this is done the right way. <laughs> Shit. This season on Ghost Story. Everything has possibility, doesn't it? In murder. My dad would never have killed my mom. He loved her. There's a legal term for phrases like that. This is all bullshit. What is the actual evidence? I feel deeply disturbed by that experience. Yeah. We're going to be more traumatized by this podcast than we were about the murder, I'll tell you that. You are deconstructing an age-old story that a family has told itself. You're not going to get to the truth. There is going to be blowback. Follow Ghost Story on the Wondery app, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge all episodes ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey. Ghost Story is a production of Wondery and Pineapple Street Studios. It's hosted by me, Tristan Redman. Our lead producer is Annie Brown, and senior producers are Chloe Prasinos and Jess Hackle. Our producers are Zandra Ellen and Emerald O'Brien. And our associate producer is Natalie Peart. Our editor is Joel Lovell, with fact-checking by Maximo Anderson. The theme song and music by Daryl Griffith, supplied by APM Music. There's mixing and original music by Hannes Brown. Pineapple's head of sound and engineering is Raj Makija, with assistant engineers Sharon Bardales and Jade Brooks. The senior audio engineer for Ghost Story is Davey Sumner, and the senior producer of development for the show is Jess Hackle. The artwork is by Brian Kluge. Legal services for Pineapple Street by Rachel Strom and Sam Kate Gumpert from Davis Wright Tremaine, David Hurst from 5RB, and Crystal Tupia at Odyssey. The senior producer for Wondery is Michelle Martin, with producers Brian Taylor White and Grant Rutter. The managing producer for Wondery is Rachel Sibley, and the coordinating producer is Sarah Mathis. Our executive producers at Pineapple Street are Maddie Sprunkaiser, Max Linsky, and Jenna Weiss Berman. Our executive producers for Wondery are Morgan Jones, Rich Knight, Marshall Louie, and Jessica Radburn. Special thanks to Jonah Hull, Ed and Chloe Caesar, Alison Vermeulen, Jonathan Oates, 
Eleanor Johnson Ward, Barney Lee, and Chris, Jan, Sophie, and Justine Redman. This episode contains public sector information licensed under the Open Government License version 3.0. Thank mm-hmm. you.